Hello and welcome to this video from Steamforge Games, where we're going to be learning how to play the 1-4 to four player game Devil May Cry The Bloody Palace. My name is Jamie Perkins and I led the development of this game, and I'm here to tell you all about it. They say that style counts for everything. Well, it certainly does in the universe of Devil May Cry. Um, based on the Bloody Palace game mode from the Devil May Cry 5 video game, players will be taking on the role of a devil hunter and trying to outscore each other by slaying demons in the most stylish and amazing way. It's not about how many demons you manage to take down, it's about how amazing your devil hunter looks while they do it. Uh, once all the demons have been slain, the player with the highest amount of style points wins the game. So, let's learn how to set up and play. To set up, first you need to determine a first player, and then taking it in turns, you're going to choose your Devil Hunter. So the first thing you'll need to get when you've chosen your Devil Hunter is take your Hunter board, then take the Hunter's miniature, their Hunter reference card, their, the Hunter's deck, and their style marker. And all these pieces individually will show the Hunter's colour that's unique to them, and their iconography as well. So each player's Hunter board should look a little bit like this. You'll have your Hunter card up here in the top left-hand corner, you'll have your starting deck placed face down here, and you'll have your upgrade deck off to one side, like so. Um, the difference between your starting deck and your upgrade deck is that your starting deck cards will have your Devil Hunter's symbol in the bottom right-hand corner. Upgrade cards will instead show this cost symbol. The only other cards that need to be separated out are the four basic attack cards, which will show that Hunter symbol in the bottom right-hand corner and this um, basic attack symbol in the bottom left. These are placed face up underneath your Hunter board and they're there for the, for the remainder of the game. Um, the only other thing to bear in mind is it's a good idea to leave some space to the right hand side of your Hunter board because you'll need this space to place cards during the game. So the next thing we'll need to do is randomly generate the enemies that we'll be playing against during the game. And this is controlled by the Bloody Palace deck. Um, in a standard game of Devil May Cry the Bloody Palace, there are four waves of enemies, and each wave is determined by one of the cards in the Bloody Palace deck. So we're going to be setting up for a two-player game. Um, the cards you'll insert into this deck are different depending on the number of players you're playing with. Um, so for us, we're going to be drawing the boss card. You will always draw the boss card in your Bloody Palace deck. Then we're going to be drawing one of the random level 3 cards. Then a level 2 card. And then we need a starting card for a two-player game. And this has generated our Bloody Palace deck. So the next thing we need to do is set up the game board. So we have our game board in the centre of the playing space, and we've also created a supply of the tokens we'll need during the game off to one side. The Devil Hunters each take a turn in positioning them themselves in the starting hexes, which are these blue highlighted hexes in the centre. So Nero has already been set up, so we'll place Dante like so. Each of the Devil Hunters then places their style marker on the zero mark of the style track around the edge of the game board. Once that's been done, we flip the top card of the Bloody Palace deck to reveal the first wave of enemies that we're going to be playing against. So as you can see here, we've set up the enemies on the game board, and we've done this using the Bloody Palace card. There's a little mini-map uh, that tells us where the enemies are supposed to go, and which enemies we'll be facing. So we have one of these Hell and Sonora enemies, and five of the Impusa enemies. We know which way the Bloody Palace card is supposed to face, because there are orientation marks on the Bloody Palace card with matching orientation marks on the game board. In addition to that, we've taken the data cards for each of these enemies, the Impusa and the Hell and Sonora, placed them to the side of the game board, and we've shuffled their behavior decks ready to play with. For the, uh, for the players, we've given the first player token over to Nero, who's going to be our first player for this game, and then each of the Devil Hunters should draw the top five cards of their starting deck for their starting hand. So the last thing we need to do before we start playing is draw from the achievement deck. So uh, the Bloody Palace card that we've drawn will tell us how many achievements we have for the round. So this is saying we have three of them available. Um, usually a Bloody Palace card will tell you whether or not to include the challenging achievements. That, those have this keyword challenging over here. We've taken them out and left them to the side. So we now know we need to draw three achievement cards for this round, which are drawn and placed face up where all the players can see them. And now we're ready to play. So let's learn how to play with your Devil Hunter. The first thing to know about the Devil Hunter is that each of them has a unique deck of attacks and special moves. Um, you're going to be playing cards from your hand to, to, into a combo chain to try and score points and also have an effect on the game board. When you play an attack card, they will usually have uh, one or two combo links on either side of the attack. So we show the attack here in the middle, and then we have the combo links on either side. Once I've played this attack card, it has an effect on the game board, so in this case I'd be doing some damage to the demons around me. And after I've played this card, I can only play cards of the same combo link colour after it. So I could play another card with a blue link, and again. But if I run out of cards with that same colour, so as you see here I have a card with red links, I can't play this because it doesn't have the matching links. 
Other cards that, you, you'll have, that you'll find in your deck uh, that are not attacks will just state on them what they're meant to be used for, such as the strategize. The main difference here is that these are not played into your combo link, you play them and then they just go into your discard pile. So now we've moved on to the hunting phase, and this is where players are going to take turns activating their Devil Hunter to play cards in their hand, as I've just explained. So let's take a turn with Dante. Um, one of the things that, uh, that Devil Hunters can do during their turn is make a run. So this can be used before, so in between or after playing any cards from your hand. And it can be useful if you need to get away from some demons, if there's too many, or if you need to run towards them. So with the game setup as it is, Dante is a little bit too far away to hit any of the enemies on the game board. So we're going to use his movement stats here on his, um, his Hunter card of 5, which means he can move up to 5 hexes. And we're just going to move him just up to here so that he can now start to attack this Impusa. So, now that Dante has run next to the Impusa, it's time to make some attacks. These are the cards that we've drawn for Dante's opening hand. Um, we can't play any of these as the first card, however, uh, because the first card we need to play needs to match the combo link on the Hunter board, which is this gold starting link over here. And this is where your basic attack cards come in that I mentioned earlier. Basic attack cards are always underneath your Hunter board, and they always face up, they're always available. They basically always count as if they're in your hand. Um, and whenever they come out of combo chains, they'll go back into the basic attack area. So it just means you've always got cards available to start off new combo chains. So the first thing we're going to play is Rebellion Swing. The reason I'm choosing Rebellion Swing is because it has a blue link coming out and I have multiple blue link cards in my hand. So it makes a smart choice for me to use this card. I place it into my, uh, as the first card in my combo link and then I uh, use the actions on the game board. So in this case, Rebellion Swing doesn't have any movement effects for it, but what it does do is it does one damage to the Impusa stood in front of me. This small hex grid represents where your hunter is on the game board. There's a, the, so you are on the hex in the center. There's the arrow shows that this is which way the hunter is facing. On the hunter miniatures, there are some small uh, sort of lips on the edge of the bases, just to show you which way is the front direction. Um, for Dante, it's pretty straightforward because his pistol is also facing the same way. So this just shows that the, the enemy in the hex in front of me is going to take one damage. So I'll take a one damage token, place it next to the Impusa. From this point onwards, I can play additional cards and continue to attack with my combo chain. So now that we've made our first attack with Dante, we can keep playing cards from our hand uh, until we've run out of cards to play with, if we want to. So the next card I'm going to play is going to be Rebellion Cut Right. This is going to have the blue links, as I mentioned, our earlier card has a blue link as well, so I've got to follow on from that. The differences with this card is that this is going to cause two damage rather than one to the hex straight in front of me, to this poor Impusa just over here. So we put two more damage onto them. Um, if there was another enemy just stood in this hex to the right over here, that would also be taking one damage. So there are, there are cards that can hit multiple enemies at once. In this case, we've just got the single Impusa though. However, there are some other highlighted icons on this attack. This yellow icon here that's been lit up shows that Dante knocks back any enemies that he's, that he's hit. This isn't something they can choose not to do. It, it happens regardless of whether you want it to or not. But you can choose the direction. So this enemy Impusa can be knocked back here, here or here. And it can be useful for herding enemies around the table and grouping them together to hit all at once. In this case, though, we're just going to push the Impusa straight back. This green icon that's also highlighted on the card shows that Dante can follow up one of the enemies that he's hit with the attack. Um, so in this case, he's going to follow the Impusa and step into the hex that was just vacated. Let me place that attack card in our combo chain, make sure the damage follows the enemy around the table. So we've now played two attack cards for Dante, but there are some other things that we can do with these cards in his hand. Um, there's one other element of attack cards to tell you about, though. So if I had played this Rebellion Strike card, it has this blue symbol uh, highlighted at the top here. If I'd played this attack on the Impusa and it managed to survive, I'd be placing a stun token on it, which is important for when the enemies try to act later in the turn. However, I'm not going to play it as an attack. Instead, I'm going to use it for additional movement. So see these symbols down here in the left, bottom left-hand corner? The bottom one here is used to defend yourself when the enemies hit you back. This top one is called a step icon, and it's used for additional movement, say, if you've already used your run or you don't want to use your run just yet. So instead of playing this into my combo board, I'm going to say I'm going to use this card to step, it has a 1 in the icon, so I can step up to 1 hex. Let's move Dante like so, just to get a little bit further away from this big choppy guy over here. And then once I've done that, I'm going to take the card and just put it into my discard pile. Or I could even try one of these upgraded ranged attacks. I also realized I didn't explain ranged attacks earlier, so just to take a second on those. Whereas with melee attacks, you're attacking the hexes directly in front of you as shown on the grid. Ranged attacks here, shown with these pistol symbols around the outside, will attack any enemy that is in front of you. Pick one of them. Um, if there are multiple enemies that are in front of you, you're always going to attack the closest one, unless there are multiple closest, and then you get to choose from those enemies. So in this case, if I was shooting this Hell Antonora with this charge volley, um, it doesn't matter how far, how close he is at all, 
As long as I'm looking towards him, then he'll take three damage. Okay, so let's talk about how Dante can score some style points. So we've skipped ahead a little bit here and we've placed a few more attack cards into his combo chain. Um, so the way in which Dante scores points is he claims this combo chain. So we count up the number of cards in it in total. For me, that's five. On your hunter board, there's a small table that just shows you how many style points you'll score for a combo chain of, of whatever size. So for five cards, I'm gonna score two points. So I'd move my style marker up to the two points mark on the style track. And after that, we're then gonna discard all these cards. So take all of the cards from the starting deck and they'll get placed in the discard pile. And your basic attack card is gonna to return to the basic attacks area and it can actually be used again in the same turn. Um, claiming your combo doesn't end your turn. So you could claim it at the start of your turn to get a huge whack of points and then start playing cards and build another combo chain. Or you could build a large combo chain during your turn and then claim it at the end in case you're worried about it being taken away when the enemies attack you. So just going back to the game board for a moment, if Dante actually manages to cause enough damage to take any of the enemies out, then um, you just remove that miniature from the table. Once it's been removed, they're going to get replaced by a number of red and sometimes green orbs as well. So on the Impusa's uh, behavior card, or, so the data card, sorry, it shows here that they drop two red orbs when they're taken down. So we drop one into the space where the Impusa just was, and then the Devil Hunter that, that, that slew them can put another red orb in any of the adjacent hexes. The same would be the case if you drop any green orbs as well, they're dropped in the same manner. But when you pick them up, they do different things. So then when it's during your turn and you actually move into a hex that contains any red or green orbs, you just pick them up automatically. So let's say that Dante had done a sort of a two, move, two hex move over here, picked up these two red orbs, I'd pick these two red orbs up and just put them onto my hunter board. So later in the game, I can spend these to purchase upgrade cards for my deck. Um, if I pick up any green orbs, those will recover damage on my uh, Devil Hunter for three damage each. So when these are picked up, they're spent immediately, returned to the supply, and then you remove three damage per token from your Devil Hunter. So we've talked about more or less everything that Dante can do during his turn. Um, so let's talk about when that turn ends. So that, you can end your turn at any point. There's nothing that's going to trigger that for you on purpose. Um, however, if you have any cards left in your combo chain, they're going to stay there over the course of multiple turns until either you get hit by an enemy or until you've claimed it for style points. So that's actually a really good way of building really long combo chains to score a big set of points at once. Um, don't worry about if you have any cards left in your hand at the end of a turn. In fact, that's actually probably a good idea because you'll need those cards to defend yourself with when the enemies activate. Okay, so now let's say that all the Devil Hunters have taken one turn each, and after they've all taken a turn, it's time for the enemy phase. So in the enemy phase, we're going to be drawing behavior cards for them one at a time, as ordered by the Bloody Palace card. So for us, it says here that the Hell Antonora is at the top, so we draw a Hell Antonora card first. So drawing from the Hell Antonora's deck, we have drawn Hack and Slash. So this is going to move two hexes towards the nearest hunter and make this attack. And you'll notice that the way in which enemies attack, it looks very similar to when the, the Devil Hunters use their attack cards as well. We still have that hex grid to keep it all nice and uniform for you. So um, because here this Hell Antonora is actually equidistant to two different Devil Hunters, um, the same number of hexes away, whenever you get a choice like this where it could go one way or the other and it's, that it's equal, the first player actually makes that choice. So because the first player in our game is Nero, he's decided it's probably not a good idea if the Hell Antonora goes for him, so he's going to send it towards Dante. The Hell Antonora has managed to reach Dante, so it's actually going to take a swing at him and try and hit him with his attack. So in the same way as the Devil Hunter attack cards show you by hex what's taking a certain amount of damage, Dante is going to take three because he stood right in, in the front of this Hell Antonora now that it's moved. Um, Dante, however, can try to dodge this attack by playing any remaining cards that he has in his hand. So at the moment, we only have this Balrog kick card left. Um, I have this dodge symbol of one in the bottom left-hand corner. I would need to actually play a total of three dodge to actually to avoid the attack because it's doing three damage. Unfortunately, we only have this one card in the hand, so it's not enough to dodge the attack. So Dante is going to take the three damage. We put that on his hunter card over here. He has a total health of eight, so if he takes eight... Um, eight damage on his hunter card, that's going to knock him out. Um, however, because he's taken any damage at all, it's going to actually destroy the combo that he was building. So we take these cards and discard them, and we replace any of the basic attack cards underneath the hunter board, just in the same way as we would as if we'd claimed the combo, but we don't get any points for it. So we really do want to avoid taking damage from enemies where possible. So we've activated this Hell Antonora. Um, if there were any more of this type of enemy on the game board, then we'd actually be drawing a behavior card for each of them. Say if we had two or three, we'd be drawing a behavior card for each Hell Antonora. Um, once we've done them, we move on to the next enemy type, which for us is going to be the Empusas. We're going to be drawing one behavior card for all of them, however, because they're a swarm enemy, which says 
on the data card that they are a swarm enemy. So when we draw the behavior card for the impulses, the, the behavior itself is actually called swarm. Um, so in this case, they're all going to perform the same thing and move three hexes towards the nearest hunter. So these, this impulse will move towards Nero, the nearest hunter, as will this one, as will this one. The only difference is going to be that this little impulse just here has a stun token from earlier in the turn because he got hit by a particularly hard attack. So all that means is we take the stun token, return it to the supply, and that is instead of the impulse activating. So it's not actually going to get to do anything at all this turn. Additionally, if you're ever trying to draw from your starting deck, but your deck is empty because they're all in the discard pile, you just shuffle your discard pile to create a new deck, place it face down, and keep playing the game. So once all of the enemies have taken a turn and had behavior cards drawn from them, the enemy phase ends. Um, there's a little bit of cleanup to do just at the end of the turn here. So for the players, they can discard any number of cards remaining in their hand. This can be useful for cycling cards out. So let's say I had that, that long blue combo chain earlier. Perhaps I've got red cards in my hand that I don't want. So I could discard those in the hopes of drawing more blue cards. Once the players have discarded any cards in their hands they don't want, they'll draw back up to a hand size of five. Then the first player token gets passed around the table to the left. So for us, because we're just playing a two player game, it will get passed over to Dante. And then we'll start a new turn by going back to the hunting phase and Dante will get to activate first. So once the last enemy on the board has been slain, the stage ends and we're going to be setting up for the new one. So don't take the Devil Hunters off the game board, they're going to be staying where they are uh, and that's when the new enemies appear, that's exactly where they're going to be. Um, if you have a combo chain in place, don't discard that, that will also persist into the next round. Uh, and the only other thing that we need to do is to pass the first player token around as if a normal round had ended. So the other thing that the players can do between stages is they can spend any red orbs that they've earned to purchase upgrade cards. Um, these can be more powerful attacks or brand new special abilities uh, that they haven't had previously. There's quite a, a reasonable, reasonably sized deck of upgrades for each Devil Hunter and they're unique to each Devil Hunter as well. Um, so for Dante I could purchase Rebellion Slam, um, which would cost me three of the red orbs that I have. You can see it's a more powerful attack than ones that I've shown earlier. So let's say for example that Dante had purchased Rebellion Slam and Charge Volley like I mentioned earlier. So that would cost me a total of five red orbs, three for um, Rebellion Slam and two more for Charge Volley. Any additional cards that I've purchased that are attacks will go into my discard pile. And then before we set, set up the next round, um, I'm going to be taking my deck and my discard pile, shuffling them together so those new cards are shuffled in and that deck is ready to play with. Um, any cards that you've purchased that are not attacks, some of them will just say uh, that they're upgrade cards like um, Get More Orbs. These are permanent passive abilities that will remain in play for the remainder of the game. When you purchase cards like this, just place them to the side of your hunter board to remind you that that effect is in play for the rest of the game. So to start a new stage of enemies, um, the first player will flip the next card of the Bloody Palace deck. Uh, and then we start the process again, as we did earlier, placing enemies on the game board. We're going to take the achievement cards that are remaining from the last round, shuffle them back into the deck, deal a new set of achievements, as shown on the Bloody Palace card. Um, if any enemies are trying to spawn where the Devil Hunters already are, you're just going to move the Devil Hunters up to the nearest adjacent space to make, sp to make room for the enemies that are coming in. And that's done by the player controlling that Devil Hunter. Okay, so now we've talked about the Devil Hunters and how most of the enemies work, let's talk about large and gigantic enemies. So what we have here is a large enemy with the Impusa Queen. So you can see that she takes up three hexes. And with the boss in the core set, you can see that this is the Elder Geryon Knight who takes up seven hexes, and this is a gigantic enemy. So there's a couple of extra rules about how these enemies move around the game board, just because of their size. So the first thing they can do is they will just move to an adjacent hex, kind of like any other miniature in the game, but just bearing in mind that they can't enter a hex that's occupied by something else. So if I move, the Impusa Queen, you can see I can move her one hex in any direction without changing the way that she's facing. And it's the same for the Elder Geryon Knight. If I'm going to move him one hex at a time, I'll move him like so without changing the direction in which he's facing. Um, the other way in which they can move is that they can pivot. So you can spend a point of movement to actually just change the direction without moving into any new hexes. So for the Impusa Queen, I could pivot in one of three directions. And for the Elder Garion Knight, I've got quite a bit more choice because of sheerly how, how big he is. 
Now, just in terms of making these choices, you might be wondering why. Um, so remember that the behavior cards will tell you how these miniatures move most of the time. They will be towards or away from the nearest devil hunter. But sometimes you have that choice of going, which way do I go because they're equidistant? Or sometimes there are multiple routes to get around enemy miniatures on the game board. Remember, it's the responsibility of the first player to do this. So if there are different ways to move around, they're, ones, they're the players that are going to be making the choice of exactly which route to take. So it can matter sometimes about which variety of movement that you use. The, the last way to move these miniatures around is by, um, it's called turning. So instead of pivoting or moving, turning is where you pick one of the hexes that they're occupying and you rotate the miniature around that hex. So for the Impusa Queen, if I was to turn on this hex, the other two are going to move around like so. And this can be quite useful for turning these miniatures around corners. And it would be the same for the Eldegarian Knight. So if I was going to turn him on this hex, he'd rotate like so. And then if I was going to do it again, he would rotate like so. And that's how we move around large and gigantic enemies. The only other thing to really bear in mind about the Elder Garion Knights and bosses in particular is that they have four different health values as shown on their data card. And this is because, as we mentioned earlier, the Bloody Palace cards are scaled um, to depend on the number of players that you're playing the game with, and it's the same with the boss health. So if you're playing a one-player game, you can see here it would have 45 health, 55 for two players, 65 for three players, and 75 for four players. So once the Devil Hunters have played through to the fourth and final stage, the boss round, you're playing against the Elder Garion Knight, once the boss has been slain, that's going to end the game. Um, the only other thing to remember about the boss round is that there is a special achievement for playing against the boss, the Demon Slayer, um, which is always played during a boss round. Um, that's granted to the player that actually takes out and slays the boss. So remember to give that achievement because it's quite important. It's big, big whack of 10 points right at the end there. To determine who's won, we'll have a look at the style track to see where the various style ranks, style uh, markers are at the moment. At the moment, Nero is in the lead. However, Dante has collected some achievements during the game. So we'll flip those over now and we'll add extra style points to him. So he has six extra style points for the achievements he's, he's gained. So he would go one, two, three, four, five, six, just ahead of Nero. And he would actually be the monarch of the Bloody Palace. And that is everything that you need to know to play Devil May Cry The Bloody Palace. If you're interested to learn more about this game or to purchase any of its three expansions, you can find those on our website. Um, outside of that, from myself and everyone at Steamforge Games, thank you for watching and we hope you enjoy playing the game.